Hello and welcome back to our bookshop in Tring. I'm Ben Morehouse. So we've got another author interview. We're talking to Jan Carson. Uh, she's considered one of the most uh, original and exciting authors to come out of Northern Ireland for uh, for certainly her generation. And uh, her new book is called The Fire Starters, uh, which is a uh, dark, repulsive and thrillingly original. This tale of fierce familial love and sacrifice fizzes with magic and wonder. Um, previously... Uh, Jan has written the postcard stories um, every day in 2015. Jan uh, wrote a story on the back of a postcard and mailed it to a friend. In this collection of highlights, Jan Carson presents a panoramic view of contemporary Belfast, its streets, coffee shops, museums and airports through a series of small but perfectly formed snapshots of her home. Now, at the end of this interview, she does read from her latest uh, series of stories uh, so that's very much worth um, watching through to the end for so thank you so much she's in conversation with Nikki Bull thank you Ben and thank you particularly for giving me this opportunity to catch up with my friend Jan from Northern Ireland we haven't spoken for a while but uh, we've been in touch via Facebook a lot Jan is the author of a number of books and most recently the fire starters which received a literature prize and sent her scurrying around the world on various workshops, but literary festivals, etc. So she's going to talk to us a bit about that and about the things she's been doing during lockdown and, uh, and the plans for the future. Jan. Hi, Nikki. It's lovely Hello. to see you. Thank you for having me. So tell us a little bit about how you came to write The Firestarters. It's obviously set in Belfast, where you know the area very, very well. And two main characters and their children with overlapping stories. Tell us a little bit about it. So yeah, The, the Firestarters is a magic realist novel. Um, I, for my sins, I'm mostly a magic realist. My parents will tell you I've got an overlapping imagination. I struggle to keep things real. Um, and it's set in East Belfast specifically, which is the quite working class area that grew up around the shipyards in Belfast, predominantly a Protestant neighbourhood. Um, and it's where I live. So um, you could say, first of all, I'm quite a lazy writer. I didn't do a lot of research for this book. I just was a bit nosy with my neighbours mostly. Um, it's set in what we would call parade season in Northern Ireland, June, July, August, which is the kind of loyalist marching season. You might have heard of things like the 12th day parades. Um, and it follows um, a particularly troubled summer. So there's been a lot of political unrest and riots and all sorts of things around some new government regulations. And um, the two protagonists are Jonathan, who is a GP, who is unfortunate enough to answer a house call and find himself seduced by a mythical siren. It happens to the best of us. Um, and he's left um, nine months later with a little baby called Sophie and he's not sure if Sophie's going to turn out to be a siren or a human child. The other protagonist is Sammy, and Sammy is an ex-paramilitary, so the, at the point he became a father, he removes himself from the paramilitaries, and uh, for the sake of his children, he moves out of the city a little. And Sammy's horrified in this period to discover that his son Mark has got involved in the paramilitaries and is actually orchestrating the violence that's happening this summer. So essentially, it, it is a book about Northern Ireland, it's a book about um, not necessarily the troubles but more more or less the kind of complicated legacy of the troubles and where we are now as a country but it's also a story about parents and very much about the kind of the responsibilities of a father are you responsible for what your child does or are they a kind of separate entity to you um, and I guess for me, the idea for the fire starters came from, I was actually given a talk in Washington DC um, and I had read a magic realist short story and followed that up with a piece of realist fiction about these enormous bonfires that the Protestant community builds here every summer. And the um, question came up was, you know, was this magic realism too? And I said, no, 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 this is real. And I at that point realised, first of all, there wasn't a little, lot of understanding outside of Northern Ireland about the kind of loyalist culture that goes on here. And secondly, that there was something almost fantastical, super mundane about some of these symbols that we associate with loyalist culture. So the giant bonfires are sometimes 70 foot tall. 
um, King Billy on his white horse, the Red Hand of Ulster. There's a fine line there between realism and kind of tipping into the magical. And that, as a magic realist, that really fascinated me because my background is in um, very politically charged magical realism. So Gabriel Garcia Marquez and Gunter Grass and Salman Rushdie, whose politics and kind of social, social um, analysis interlapped with the fantastical. And I thought, well, where better but Northern Ireland to do that? So that's kind of a, a everything in a nugget there. Yeah, so Jan, you, you mentioned being in Washington there, and I know that after your book was published, you ended up going all over the world. How did you find speaking about the, the very particular situation in Belfast in countries as far as part as um, India, I think I'm right, India and places in Eastern Europe, where perhaps they had no idea, some of them, about the situation in your book? Um, I How think they do that. It, it's interesting that like, you, you encounter two different levels of kind of understanding about Northern Ireland, particularly in North America, there is a real sense that the kind of the Catholic, the nationalist narrative of the Troubles is what people are familiar with. So um, I think Hollywood particularly has played a huge role in that. You know, if you see anything represented, it's usually kind of the Republicanism of, of the Northern Ireland conflict. So I've had people walk out of readings in disgust and things as soon as I say I'm a Protestant, <laughs> which is interesting. And some people don't understand that there are Protestants in Northern Ireland. Um, the, the flip that must side be quite of it, disconcerting. <laughs> it is, it is. It's a strange experience. I mean, the flip side of it and the thing that I have loved the most is traveling particularly in areas um, that are post-conflict or even, you know, currently experiencing com some conflict. So I've been fortunate enough to be paired with things like Kashmiri writers and writers who grew up during the Balkan conflict and um, post-Soviet writers. And there's such a resonance there, a sense of empathy of shared experience and not just shared experience, but learning from each other. So it quite often moves from the great conversation in the reading to the pub, where we spend <laughs> hours and hours kind of comparing notes, but also learning from each other. So that's been a huge blessing. And um, I guess that the Firestarters in particular, it won the EU prize for literature for Ireland last year. And with that came and um, so far 12 translations into different languages. So it's currently translated into Spanish and Italian and we have languages like Croatian and Arabic and all sorts of different languages forthcoming. And that opens for more doors to have these conversations. Yeah, fascinating. And obviously you've not been able to do any of those journeys during lockdown, but you've carried on with various events that have brought in people from other countries talking about the fire starters. Yeah, um, and I've been part of, I'm, I'm quite involved in a kind of network. Um, it's called um, the Debates on Europe. It's, it's a, a European funded project that brings together writers and creatives from um, I'm always uncomfortable using the term post-conflict in Northern Ireland because it's much more complicated than that, but writers who represent largely post-conflict countries, mm -hmm. and I've been involved in a several debates there during the pandemic, and they're looking at how each of those countries is responding to COVID-19, and even the learning from that is, it's incredibly interesting to hear how particularly post-Soviet countries are responding. It's wildly different from our experience over here so I think we're always learning from each other and it was a huge kind of surprise to me that to write fiction would actually be the invitation into some of these conversations which are quite political and about about you know social issues and shaping the future and things it's, it's a huge honor to be you know make up a story and that invites you to a table like this uh, but that, in a way, you, you've obviously always been very open to that sort of opportunity because of your work, um, cross-community work in Belfast in the arts. Um, t tell us a little bit about that because that obviously has a big connection with what you're now doing. Yeah, I guess um, I've been a community arts facilitator for over 20 years now. Um, and the community arts sector in Northern Ireland has played a huge role in the peace and reconciliation process. So, um, you know, primarily it brings people from both communities together into a, a shared space. 
Um, but I also think it has taught a lot of people soft skills that have been missing in Northern Irish culture. So it's very, very hard here for people to practice empathy because quite often we grow up segregated. So how, how are you supposed to understand what life is like for someone else if you never have, you know, if you don't know, have any friends who aren't from the same background as you? And the school system still largely segregated and government housing and things. So these um, conversations around learning how to empathise, which I think the creative act, particularly writing, you know, fiction, you're putting yourself in the shoes of another character. Even when you read, it's an act of empathy. Those skills can be taught and then translate it into kind of the, the, the social realms that we're working in in Northern Ireland at the minute, that, that people could be able to imagine life a life that isn't theirs. Mm. I think it's it's much more difficult to hate and to segregate when you have the ability to empathise with other people. So that that's been. I'm a massive advocate for community arts. I think it's probably the hill that I will die upon. Um, but this particular book, and I guess the next one as well, have been hugely influenced by the the groups and the the people in the community that I've worked with in the last twenty years. There's a lot of their wee voices popping up all over the place. You, you, you mentioned there the next book, and, and I know that the Firestarters was the first of, it, am I right in thinking, a four book deal that you managed um, to land? So I have three books with Double Day. I've got another um, short story collection, which is coming out at the beginning of next year. It's very exciting because it's also going to be broadcast. All 10 stories will be broadcast on Radio 4. Brilliant. So that's a bit of a world exclusive for you. That was just sorted last week. Um, so that will come out at the start of next year and hopefully towards the end of next year, um, the second novel with Double Day. Um, and then I also have a collection of microfiction coming out next month with a different publisher. Oh, so. More postcard, postcard stories? Yeah, more postcard Wonderful. stories. So um, that's shaping up to be quite a busy year. That's three books in 12 months at the minute. Wow. Yes, incredibly busy. And would it, it would be great for, for people watching this and maybe you could read a little bit from the fire starters just yeah. to give people a flavour of the book. Mm -hmm. Do you want something? Um, oh, I think I'll just read actually the first couple of pages because it's, it's my favourite bit to read and it, it kind of really grounds you in, in Belfast. Um, one of the things I wanted to do with this book is to think about how we tell truth here in Northern Ireland. Um, so there's a, a, a whole thing about, you know, whoever you ask about the troubles, you're going to get a different version depending on how that person's feeling that day or their political persuasion or their class. and it makes truth a very nebulous concept. Everyone has a different version. And actually that starts to trickle into language then. So, you know, it's impossible to tell a story straight in Northern Ireland. And it's one of the things I wanted to do with this book is to play around with the idea of language as an, not a fixed concept, essentially. So the, this is the, the first um, opening couple of pages of the novel. This is Belfast. This is not Belfast. Better to avoid calling anything a spade in this city. Better to avoid names and places, dates and second names. In this city, names are like points on a map or words worked in ink. They are trying too hard to pass for the truth. In this city, truth is a circle from one side and a square from the other. It is possible to go blind staring at the shape of it. Even now, 16 years after the Troubles, it is much safer to stand back and say with conviction, sure it all looks the same to me. The Troubles are over now. They told us so in the newspapers and on the television. Here, we're very great with religion. We need to believe everything for ourselves. We're all about sticking the finger in and having a good hook around. We didn't believe it in the newspapers or on the television. We didn't believe it in our bones. After so many years of sitting one way, our spines had set. We will take centuries to unfold. The troubles have only just begun. This is hardly true either. It depends upon who you're talking to, how they're standing, and which particular day you've chosen for the chat. Those who are ignorant of our situation can look it up on Wikipedia and find there a 3,000 word overview. Further articles can be read online and in academic journals. Alternatively, a kind of history may be acquired from talking to the locals. Piecing this together will be a painstaking process, similar to forging one jigsaw puzzle from two, or perhaps twenty. 
the troubles is too less a word for all of this. It is a word for minor inconveniences such as overdrawn bank accounts, slow punctures, a woman's time of the month. It is not a violent word. Surely we have earned ourselves a violent word, something as blunt and brutal as apartheid. Instead, we have a word like scissors, which can only be said in the plural. The troubles is, was, one monster thing. The troubles is, are, many individual evils caught up together. Other similar words include trousers and pliers. The Troubles is always written with a capital T as if it were an event, as the Battle of Hastings is an event, with a fixed beginning and end, a point in the calendar year. History will no doubt prove it is actually a verb, an action that can be done to people over and over again, like stealing. I'll leave it there. You can probably tell my accent gets thicker and thicker when I start writing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, that, uh, moving on from, from the fire starters, um, it's probably you can't tell us too much about the next book, but perhaps you could talk a little bit about the postcard stories, um, how they started, um, the fact that you that were able to publish a collection of them based around Belfast, and then something about what you've been doing with postcard stories and particular collaboration with young artists during the lockdown. Yeah, so um, Postcard Stories for me started in 2015. I had published my first two books and I had a dreadful case of writer's block. Um, and I, I keep telling people at the minute, um, productivity is my coping mechanism. Um, probably better than developing a heroin addiction, so I'm just going to go with it. So instead of um, having a wee rest, I decided I would set myself a kind of challenge of writing a story every day for a year in, in 2015. Um, and the concept was that I actually have some sitting here. Um, the idea behind it to keep it simple was that they would have to fit on the back of a postcard. So I've got stacks of postcards now. So just your normal kind of one like this. Yeah, there's one of Nikki's. One you sent me. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so have to fit it on the back, which limits me to for me now 300 words um, and I sent them physically posted them to friends all over the world um, and I'm um, about a year after that the Emma Press who are mostly a, a poetry publisher they approached me about the possibility of publishing a selection of them so it's a selection in the first collection of about 50 of them one for every day of the year or every week of the year um, and there are 50 of my favourite, they're all based around Belfast and they are beautifully, beautifully um, illustrated by Benjamin Phillips, who's a fantastic illustrator. Um, so I continued to write that because of, I'm, I'm an agent, I couldn't give it up. Um, so now I, every time I go on holidays, instead of writing wish you were here, the weather is nice postcards, people insist upon a proper postcard story. So um, at this point, there's close to a thousand of them. Um, from all over the world and I, I guess when when the lockdown began back in March um, most of my work at that point community arts work had been with older people mm. who struggled desperately to access arts provision online so I actually began writing postcard stories to them and physically posting them out and then I thought it'd be nice to get a little bit of colour with them so I began to ask friends who had kids if they would illustrate them and it all spiralled out of control very quickly. <laughs> so 105 days later, um, I have had 135 young artists illustrating for me. We've had collaborations. So someone made a comic book, which was wonderful. Um, we collaborated with some grown-up illustrators who illustrated the kids' short stories, which was gorgeous. Um, we've had amazing amazing feedback um nursing homes telling us that you know people gather around to hear their postcard story each day i have um, a lady who's visually impaired and someone phones her up every morning to read the story down the telephone to her um, and we were here in northern ireland anyway we were featured on the bbc news which was extremely exciting for all of my wee illustrators um, so Regardless of all that, I had already planned to publish a second volume of Postcard Stories and it will come out now in August, about a month from now, with the Emma Press again. Um, sadly, none of the coronavirus postcards will be in that because it, it was all edited and good to go before this happened. 
but who knows maybe we'll get a third edition with yeah it's volume or... three waiting yeah. in the wings yeah. <laughs> um, it's just it's it's a really lovely way to keep in contact with people and I don't know about everybody else but I have sent hundreds of letters and postcards over the last few months and the sound of the letterbox rattling and I'm um, like a missile coming from my outside world that isn't a bill is <laughs> the nicest thing in the world. Brilliant. Brilliant. And um, you mentioned um, talking about keeping in touch with people and the postcard stories and community arts and the effect that the lockdown has had on particularly your work with, with older people. You've encouraged in the past older people to, to do their own stories um, mm. and to, I suppose, to, to connect with their memories and to be able to write things down, which is going to be fantastic for, for the people who come after them to be able to read them. But how do you see that impacting on their well-being when you see them producing written work, doing something perhaps they've never done before? Um. I guess it's a, a really good question, Nikki, and it, it kind of comes back a lot to what I was talking about with community arts as well. I think there's layer upon layer of benefits from it. Um, I see a lot of the older people who get involved in our projects, it's combat and isolation. So um, it's maybe the only time in the week that they physically come out and they connect with other people around a cup of tea and a piece of cake and writing. Um, and trying to recreate that at the minute with Zoom chats and things has, has, you know, people will come on and say, it's so lovely to see another face and mm -hmm. to connect. So that's connection element. I think there's also this idea of, for all of us who write, it's an act of sense making at the minute. Um, even if what you don't, if you, what you write down doesn't essentially make sense, it, you're processing something, you're getting it out of the mess and the muddle that it seems to be most people's minds at the minute and getting it onto the page where it's it's easier to process and deal with I think so I've, I've heard that from a lot of my ladies that I work with and um, some of them have gone from being quite short writers so you know in, in class they'd maybe only produce a paragraph and now they're writing four or five A4 pages every week because it's helping them to process through what what they're, they're going through and I think the other one big reason that I like to work with older people in writing is sometimes that we have missed people. You know, sometimes there are Seamus Haney's and um, Edna O'Brien's and, and Alice Munro's and, and people out there who never got the chance to pick up a pen and try. Mm -hmm. And that's the world's missing out on their work. And it, it's happened a couple of times with me in workshops over the years when someone has written their very first poem any, ever at 80 or 85. You're like, oh my goodness, like we need this. This is fantastic. And that's just a, it's a beautiful experience to be able to release them then. And I am a big believer in like, nobody's, you know, we're not in ballet dancing here as writers. Your career can go on till you're 95 or 100. Some of my favourite writers are writing well into their 90s. So to discover you're good at writing in your retirement, you still could have years and years and years to experiment and grow and develop. And it's a pleasure to get to be the person who helps folks along in that journey. Yeah, that must be wonderful. Talking about, about writers who, who wrote over quite a long period, another thing you've been doing this year, <laughs> I don't know how you managed to fit it all in with postcards, illustrations, books coming up. You're reading your way through the entire canon of Agatha Christie. I am, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why? The <laughs> um, simple reason is it's her centenary in autumn, so it's 100 years since her first public published book. And um, I've always been a big Agatha Christie fan, and I thought, I've, I've probably read most of them before in the past, but I sort of thought, if not now, when? It's a, a good chance. And I'm, I'm more than halfway through, so I'm on target. Um, what has been interesting is how Agatha Christie has resonated with this year. Um, one of the things I'm super interested in at the minute is our love of nostalgia. So if you look at, you know, you have to watch the adverts between TV at the minute and you've got Take That reforming in 80s pop groups and people hauled out of like soaps from the, the 70s and stuff. I think we find the nostalgia incredibly reassuring. And I've 
always found something very reassuring about Christie's writing. Um, Orwell has an essay about English crime fiction and how it actually, even a good English murder will actually reinstate the idea of calm rather than confuse people because evil is always punished and good is always rewarded and there is a reason for why bad things happen and that's very much through Christie's work. Mm -hmm. No one is just evil for the sake of it really. So I think there's that element. The other thing in light of what's going on in the world at the minute that has been really interesting is to watch the progression of her attitudes. So I'm reading them chronologically and I don't think anybody would argue against the fact that she was a raging xenophobe and but definite racist undertones and misogyny and all sorts of things, especially in her early work. It's interesting to watch her challenge and develop those attitudes as her, her career progresses. She's shaped by the world changing around her. And she had such a long career from the 20s right through to the 70s. You can trace the arc of kind of attitude progression. And it's made me very cautious about dipping into historical figures and writers and saying okay they said this that makes them a bad person or someone's career their lifespan is a huge amount of time and Agatha Christie at the end of her career had very different attitudes than she had in the, the, the in the early part in the 20s so I'm processing through all that at the minute I wouldn't say she's the world's most enlightened person by the end of things there's definitely <laughs> class issues she never comes to term with but there are other parts of her attitude that change dramatically across the span of her her output fascinating and you're also rewriting or writing stories based on each of her, her novels yeah um, that, that's just my wee silly thing to kind of keep myself <laughs> engaged it's very very entertaining though yeah you mentioned there about how how comforting um that sort of crime that comes to a solution and the, as you say the perpetrator gets punished is um, we share a particular fondness for Morse and Endeavour yeah. and that is <laughs> very much in the same vein but we also share an addiction to um, BBC's Casualty and Holby City I don't know if you can see yeah. <laughs> and Charlie Fairhead <laughs> I've got Charlie and I've got Seamus Heaney up here looking over me we're having to do without casualty at the moment, and I know you have a secret ambition to one day screenwrite an episode. So any hints that they're going to get in touch with you and ask you to write an episode of casualty? I don't know. People always say that, Nikki, and I don't know that I do want to do it. It's like the Holy Grail. I'd be scared of, of messing it up. I'll have a go at other things, but I don't know. I would be scared I would try casualty and make a hash of it. Maybe you could write Charlie's last episode. That would be sad. No, don't, don't. I just, <laughs> my, one, one of my big ambitions is I would really like to interview him. Um, I do, and, and quite often in the seat that you're sitting in at the minute, um, interviewing writers. And I would just I'd really, really love to interview Derek Thompson because he's from Belfast originally. Um, and he's probably one of the most recognisable Northern Irish faces um, and yet there's very, very little actual material about him. So um, if, if you're watching this, Derek, get in touch. <laughs> yeah, so before, before, perhaps before we completely sign off, Jan, you could read a couple of postcard stories from the forthcoming book. That would be, that would be brilliant because they're little, little nuggets of wonderful story. Yeah, um, these are actually world exclusive. I have not read these anywhere before, so you guys are getting the first listen at them. Um, I'm going to begin with um, a little one which is written in Bath, and I'll preface this with the fact people will maybe switch off now, but I really dislike Jane Austen. So if, if that's a problem with you, you can put your fingers in your ears now. This is about Bath. It is impossible not to imagine Jane Austen at ease in the city, walking and folding her hands in gloves. The squares are square and bordered on all four sides by privet hedges and black spiked ironwork. The buildings are the bleached blonde colour of old sand and everywhere the ivy climbs neatly, never once taking its ascendancy for granted. Even the cobblestones are correctly angled. This is a place for moderation and discreet romance. 
Small intrigues might be permitted in their proper place, but even these would be tight as a well-laid table or a slip of Sunday afternoon needlework. This is the kind of city which is always clean and inclined to resolve itself in the time necessary to drain a china teacup and refill. In other words, Bath is two square miles of sense and sensibility, the kind of place which made those Brontes howl. Um, I do love the Brontes, I had to get that in at the end. Um, and the secondary story I wanted to, to read, I was commissioned actually to write these um, two pieces about textiles, which textiles are a huge part of the Northern Irish um, history, um, linen in particular. And my grandmother, I wrote them about my two grandmothers, um, one who was a champion knitter and the other who worked in a linen mill. So this is about my, my granny Agnes who worked in a linen mill. Your father's mother was Agnes. She came from a rural townland, all vowels and phlegm to say. Her home house was a series of small box, boxes stacked one upon the other, a neat and God-fearing establishment with nothing in the way of show. So many weans went through that wee house, they ran out of good Protestant names to give them. So the last was called after the first, who died young of something you could cure with antibiotics now. Your granny was a weaver of linen, no different from all the other Agnes's tending loom in Lisburn, Belfast and Portadown. She took her lunch in her hand each morning and walked a dark mile there and back. She did not see herself party to something significant, yet each morning she took the raw yarn in her hands and though it was as old ladies' hair or horse tails caught up in knots, saw only what it could be a handkerchief, a Sunday shirt, a finely embroidered tablecloth peeling over a big house table. She lifted her shuttle and wove the future into each tangled strand and did not stop till the mills began falling down around her. Picture your granny every day from eight till six, first in Ross's factory age 13 all the way up to the age you are now, then later in the Phoenix which was farther to walk but more money. Picture her lame in the foot from a dropped shuttle. Picture her wearing her retirement watch to church, hoiking her sleeve up to show the gold of it off. Picture 10,000 women like her, spinning, weaving and stitching, leaning against mill walls, smoking. Tell yourself there was nothing remarkable about your granny. And this is why you never asked. And I'll, I'll finish Wonderful. there. I particularly love that because uh, it feeds into my interest in family history and being able to picture an ancestor in that way and in and what they did. That's fantastic. Thank you ever so much, Jan. Thank you. Massive thanks to Nikki and to Jan for that wonderful interview. So um, both the postcard stories and also the fire starters are available in uh, our bookshop. Give us a call 01442 827 six five three or uh, all the other purchase blurb is available in the text below this video thank you so much uh, for uh, joining us hope you've enjoyed that we've got loads more author interviews to come and uh, please do subscribe to our youtube channel um, at the end of this as well thank you so much and we'll see you soon <laughs>